Question one. Prospero was probably going to marry Ferdinand and Miranda with his show of spirits. Do you think this would have been a legitimate marriage? Why or why not? So we looked at this part last week. Um, this is after Prospero has said, um, okay, you guys are now engaged. And then he asks Ariel to uh, put on a show of a marriage ceremony. But would this have been a legitimate marriage? Um, I think the answer is no. And there's key evidence here. This is page 1595. And Prospero says, if thou dost break her virgin knot before all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right be ministered. So if you sleep with her before finishing the marriage ceremony. In other words, this does not count. You have to go back to find the real priest to do a real marriage. Um, so even though they are in love, Prospero has given their blessing. Because this is a religious society, they do need a priest to do the ceremony. So it's very different from today. Today, you only need two witnesses. Number two, why do you think Prospero segues into Act 4, Scene 1, 151 to 158? What's on his mind? So, what was this? Act 4, Scene 1, 151 to 58. Where is it? Here, page 1597. Um, so this is right after he remembers that Caliban is trying to kill him, and he tells the spirits to go away, avoid, go away. Um, so Ferdinand is like, is your dad okay? He looks kind of mad. All right, this is strange. Your father's in some passion that works him strongly. Miranda, never till this day saw I him touched with anger so distempered. So I've never seen him so angry before. So first Prospero has to explain that no, he's not angry. You do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Moved means full of emotion. Be cheerful, sir. Our rebels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, ye, all which it inherit shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. So he's saying that this performance of the marriage ceremony is just like all of these fantastic images, cloud-capped towers, towers so high that they touch the clouds, palaces, temples, the globe itself, all of this shall dissolve. And just like that show, they will fade away, leaving nothing behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, or made of. We are made of dreams. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. So this is one of the famous soliloquies of this play. It looks like he's talking about the marriage performance. But maybe he's talking about something more, right? He mentions the globe. By this point, Shakespeare was not performing at the Globe Theater. But early in his career, he became famous with the plays that he put on at the Globe Theater. So when he says the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherits shall dissolve. He's talking about the, the marriage performance, but he's also talking about life, like all of our lives. We are such stuff as dreams are made of. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. 
So uh, he's also saying life will also end. But finally, Shakespeare is talking about the theater, right? The basic, uh, the baseless fabric of this vision, this fantastical vision, these stories, the towers, the palaces, all of these great stories, great settings, even the Globe Theater itself, all of these will go away. Um, the Globe Theater burned down in 1599. So by that point, the theater itself had, in fact, dissolved. So the question is, how does Postero get from talking about the performance, and how does he transition into this great abstract soliloquy? Well, I think the connection is here. The performance were all spirits and melted into thin air. Because they're not real people, so they can disappear immediately. But then he says that this is exactly like the stories we are watching in this theater. It is exactly like the experiences that we have in this life. All of them eventually go. Uh, and then after he says uh, life is rounded with a sleep, he then transitions back. Sir, I am vexed. So I have something troubling me. You can imagine at this point there might be a long pause in the performance because it's not really a transition. It's very hard to get from the end of the soliloquy to back to the story of the play. But entering this soliloquy is the transition is quite smooth. Oh, by the way, this soliloquy might be important for the final exam. Question three, why do you think Prospero gives up his magic? 5150. Here, we're on page 1599. Uh, so here he's talking about all of the great things that he has done with his magic, but then on at the end of line 50. But this rough magic, I hear abjure. Abjure means forego, give up. I no longer want it, I no longer use it. And when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, which means, okay, now I'm going to do this as I'm talking, to work my end upon their senses that this airy charm is for. So after I call for some music to do one last thing, I'll break my staff, my magical staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth. A fathom is, I think, six feet. It's a lake. Uh, so bury it certain fathoms in the earth means I'll bury it deep in the earth. And deeper than it ever plummets down, I'll drown my book. Uh, and as for my magic book, I'm going to toss it in the ocean and let it sink to the bottom where uh, no one has ever been before. And then the music begins. Uh, and this music is near the end of the play. This is when Alonzo, the, the current Duke of Milan, and all of his people have shown up. Prospero has... Uh, Prospero has explained what's going on. Uh, and Alonzo has asked for forgiveness. Uh, and uh, Pro uh, Prospero grants this forgiveness because their children are going to marry. So they're about to become family. So here he's asking for music to celebrate this happy ending. So the question is, why does Prospero give up his magic? Well, throughout the play, he has been using his magic uh, to kind of torture and mistreat Alonzo and uh, Caliban and all of these other people. We don't, he mentions that he used magic to save Ariel, but we never see that. We only see him use magic to control Ariel. Throughout the play, he's using magic uh, in a kind of selfish way. 
to, to achieve his goals. At the same time, in Act 1, Scene 1, uh, Scene 2, in his backstory, his history, he told us that it is because he was too focused on magic that he, uh, his title, the Duke of Milan, was stolen from him. Like because he didn't do his job as the Duke, his brother kind of took over the job and forced him out. So even though magic is Prospero's source of power, it does seem like it's it doesn't do him much good. It doesn't really give him any benefits. So now that he is going to return back to Milan. Uh, and his enemy has asked him for forgiveness, and Ariel is going to be let go. There doesn't seem to be a need for him to use magic anymore. Uh, and since it has only brought him trouble, I think uh, it's a good idea for him to give up this magic. It's a happy ending. He doesn't need that much power anymore. But it's also interesting to think about this because magic is also, well, let's see if we have a question about this. Yes, we do. We're going to get back to that in question five. Uh, but first, question four. Do you think Caliban's ending is a happy one? Why or why not? Um, see if I can find it. OK, well, at the end, after everything is revealed, Caliban says, well, let's see, what was it? Uh, Prospero says to Caliban, go, Syrah, to my cell. Syrah is a title you would use for your subordinates or inferior. So it's not like Sir. Sir is uh, equals. Sira is to people inferior to you. Go, Sira, to my cell, to my room. Take with you your companions, so Trinculo and Stefano, the two drunk guys. As you look to have my pardon, trim it handsomely. So if you want me to forgive you for trying to kill me, clean up my room. Um, I do believe. Uh, Prospero gives Caliban the island back. Caliban, I that I will, I means yes. And I'll be wise hereafter and seek for grace. Uh, so I'm going to sober up. I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to ask you to forgive me. What a thrice double ass was I to take this drunkard for a god and worship this dull fool. So he finally wakes up and realizes that Stefano is not, in fact, a god. So, well, also here he said, Prospero says, he asks Ariel to set Caliban and his companions free. Um, yeah, so at the end of the play, Prospero forgives Caliban, gives him his room, and lets him go. Do you think it's a happy ending? Well, Caliban is free. Prospero is leaving. It's not going to keep torturing him. So that's good. But think of all the suffering that Caliban has been through. Do you think he deserves some kind of compensation? Do you think that all of his pain should grant him more than simply returning to what he had in the beginning? Depends on how you look at this character, right? If you think of Caliban as uh, the same way Prospero thinks of him, as like this ugly, evil, half creature, half man, who tries to rape his daughter and tries to kill him, then uh, no, he doesn't deserve better. But if you think of Caliban as the former owner of the island that was stolen by Prospero, and Prospero kept mistreating him, the rightful owner, then it does feel like Caliban deserves more than simply returning to what he had before. Maybe Prospero should give him something uh, to compensate all of his suffering. 
Um, so the answer to this question really depends on how you look at their relationship. And question five, what do you think the purpose or function of the epilogue might be? This is one of the few Shakespeare plays to have an epilogue. And the epilogue, well, let's read it and you'll see, uh, is spoken by Prospero. Now my charms are all overthrown. Charms means magic spell. So all of my magic has been tossed aside. And what strength I have's my own. So I'm not depending on magic, it's all me. Which is most faint, very weak. Now, it's true, I must be here confined by you or sent to Naples. He's talking to the audience. He's saying that I'm kept here because of you. You want to watch the play, that's why I'm here. Or I have to leave and go back to Naples. In other words, end the play. Let me not, since I have my dukedom gone and pardon the deceiver, dwell in this fair island by your spell. So now that the play is over, I got back my titles. I have forgiven my enemy. Don't keep me here on this fair island. <laughs> by your spell, your magic, so like the magic of the audience. But release me from my band my handcuffs, basically, with the help of your good hand. So here he's asking the audience to give him a round of applause. Gentle breath of yours, my sails must fill. Your breath must fill my sails. You have to blow me back to Naples, or else my project fails, which was to please. So here he's not just asking the audience to, to give him applause. He's also asking the audience to cheer for him. Uh, and he says, my project was to please. My only purpose was to entertain you. Now I want spirits to enforce. Want means lack, I don't have. I want spirits to enforce, art to enchant. Art here means skill or magic. So I don't have spirits, I don't have magic. And my ending is despair, unless I be relieved by prayer, unless you pray for me, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all fault. So here he's giving the traditional, forgive me for any imperfections, forgive me for any mistakes. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. So please, Forgive any imperfections and let me go. So, what is the purpose of this epilogue for Prospero talking to the audience? On the surface level, the most immediate level, he's telling the audience, play over, please clap, please cheer, and forgive any mistake. But he's still speaking in the voice of Prospero. It's not the actor talking to the audience. It's Prospero talking to the audience person. And notice also that he still refers to magic. He says, I don't have magic, but you do. Your spell. He's saying that the audience has a kind of magic. The magic to keep him on stage or to let him go back to wherever. So we see that this epilogue gives us a second meaning to the use of magic in the play. The first meaning, of course, is Prospero uses magic to control people and torture people. But here, the magic is a, is a uh, description of what happens in the playhouse. If the audience has a magic to react to the actors, then the actors also have a magic to entertain the audience. The real magic isn't what Prospero does. The real magic is that the audience can follow along the story and look at the people in costumes on stage and really see this kind of fantasy story and really imagine this kind of story. 
The real magic is in the head of the audience, in the mind of the audience, based on the performance of the actors on stage. So this connects back to the previous soliloquy about uh, the cloud capped towers and the temples and the palaces. It's talking about life and dreams, but it's also talking about the magic of the play. So even before the play ends, Prospero soliloquy is already reminding the audience that the play will end soon. Very interesting design. I wonder why. Okay, do you have questions about uh, these five? Okay, so in that case, let's take a look at the final exam. Um, so next week, no class, right? And then we have week 18. Week 18, we're going to read five Shakespeare sonnets. They will not be on the final exam, of course, because the exam is going to begin today. It's just going to be for fun. And uh, if you took my introduction to British literature, these five sonnets I did not teach in that class. These are five different sonnets. I chose five sonnets that I think are deeper, more complex, more adult. Uh, so we'll see that in two weeks. Next week, no class. OK, exams. I want to go over the exam rules one more time because a lot of you did not follow them for the midterm exams. So uh, uh, let me emphasize the rules that were broken more often. The second one, your answer must be an English essay with multiple unnumbered paragraphs. And I added a clarification for the final exam. They should not be itemized. Uh, so uh um, so any kind of itemized list, letters, numbers, um, title, uh, or sorry, subtitle, colon, and description, all of these are against the rule. You can begin each paragraph with first, second, third. That's fine, but please write an essay. If you do not answer the question, you will only get 50%. Uh, be careful about this. I had a few people misread the question. Um, if the question asks you to choose between one or the other, you must choose. You cannot say both or either one. You cannot use the film as evidence. You also cannot use information about the author or the year of publication as evidence. You must use the version from our handout. Um, so if you go online to look for information, make sure that 
the location of your evidence fits with the version of our handoff. So if you go to the website, the website, you have to write the handoff Please put your source and your location next to each piece of evidence, not at the bottom. If you have a jangi for si, it had even a jail, it didn't have a jute the deep on the bee, young gua hao, she choose, wait to hold like you. 全部寫在最下面, okay, those are the important rules that many of you uh, did not follow. Do you have questions about those? If you have questions, you can always ask me here online, email, track me down somewhere on campus. Okay. Okay. Final exam. It begins today at noon. It will end next Tuesday midnight. So I'm giving you eight days. Here are the questions. Number one in Macbeth. Whom do you think is more to blame, Macbeth or Lady Macbeth? Why? So for this question, you cannot say both are equally to blame. You have to choose one person to blame more than the other. And you'll notice that you only have two choices. You cannot blame the witches. You cannot blame fate. You have to choose Macbeth or Lady Macbeth to carry most of the blame. And number two, do you think the Tempest is more a celebration of the joys of storytelling or more a reflection on its sin? Why? Let me translate that for you. In other words, do you think the Tempest thinks of storytelling as good or bad, more good or more bad? Uh, so to answer this question, you will probably want to think about magic. You only have to answer one. Questions? Okay, well, if you need a handout, I have extra handouts of Macbeth and The Tempest in front. Uh, if you don't take one today, I'm going to throw them away. And if you have questions, you can talk to me and only me. Either today or any other time before the end of the exam. Please remember to actually submit your answer. Some people, I think, hit save or it didn't submit correctly. Make sure that your answer is submitted. Okay, so for the rest of today, I will let you think about these questions and prepare to take the exam. Uh, 